Comedian and Sports Select Committee, and this is our subcommittee on online harms and disinformation. We have a hybrid session today. We're joined in the room by Talisa Dias, the Shaw Foundation Junior Research Fellow in Law, Jesus College, University of Oxford. Hi. Hello. Uh, we're joined by Lord Putman, Chair of the Democracy and Digital Technologies Committee, joining us via Zoom, and Professor Alan Renwick, Professor of uh, Democratic Politics and Deputy Director of the Constitution Unit, University College London. So Talita, Lord Putnam and Professor Allen, thank you very much for joining us today. Dr Talita, would you um, please outline for the committee, please, the, what you perceive the sort of strengths and weaknesses of the online harms registration as it stands? So I think that the bill is quite detailed and, and quite comprehensive, and I think that's, that's the strength of the bill. Um, I think it covers a lot of ground. I think that uh, duties, of, um, duties to establish, for example, mechanisms of redress for users, um, you know, the, the, the whole idea of a duty of care is a positive one, in my opinion. Um, I think that this type of regime is, in my opinion, much better than sort of like the intermediary liability approach to to um, sort of like regulation of, of, of uh, online platforms and by intermediary liability I mean uh, the fact that uh, a certain platform can be held responsible or liable for, for the exact content that is posted on the platform and uh, whereas a duty of care for example entails a uh, responsibility not a duty uh, to achieve something a certain result but a duty to exert their best efforts to achieve a certain result by means of adopting a series of measures and I think that this is a, a positive thing in my opinion um, I think that there has been a lot of debate about that <clears throat> but I think that the bill is on the right uh, on the right path I think it's it's the right way forward However, I think that there are some weaknesses, and in my opinion, the main weaknesses are the vagueness of the definitions. Uh, the definitions of harm, the definitions of illegal content, uh, those are the main weaknesses in, in, in my view, and also the fact that the bill does not outline the measures that, uh, that the regulator uh, might sort of like impose on platforms or the measures that um, the, the platforms themselves might or may or, or must adopt uh, when, when exercising their duties uh, of care. So, so those are the weaknesses in, 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 in my view and also the fact that there is no uh, provision for judicial remedies. So I think that's to me an important uh, weakness because um, in the social media context, the online space more generally, there will be mistakes. Mm. It, that's inevitable because you're talking about difficult decisions about content, right? And these are inherently subjective. So there will be mistakes, content will be taken down er erroneously, um, people will be upset, people will be, um, you know, people will complain. And it's important to have that safeguard, uh, mm. which a internal mechanism of redress is not um, sufficient to address because it's just an internal, a private mechanism. It's not public, it's, it's not independent, it's not fully independent or legitimate. So there has to be access to, to courts. So, and the bill needs to, 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 to make sure that this is explicitly laid down there. Thank you, Dr. Das. Uh, just following on a couple of points there. Um, I completely agree when it comes to the regulator, there not being enough sort of definition of what measures need to... We were in our first session in private, we were discussing the words recommend and might uh, all sounds a bit woolly. It sounds, frankly, as if we're still letting them decide what is the best course of action in that respect. And then secondly, you mentioned about definition of harms. Now, could you just expand on that? What is it particular about that area that you feel concerned? I think that, first of all, the definition of harm is way too vague. So it's, it's a definition that includes indirect harms. Uh, so, for example, if certain content influences uh, or drives somebody to do something that might cause some harm. So that's a de an indirect definition of harm. And the evidentiary threshold to assess harm is also <laughs> quite low. 
Uh, and uh, the definition includes both material or physical harms and also psychological harms, and that is uh, very subjective, right? Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing to include a subjective definition of harm, but there has to be um, other criteria included in this definition to make it clear for users and platforms as to what kinds of content are considered to be harmful to adults and to children. So other criteria must be included. So not just harm. Harm is an important element of harmful content, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there are other things at play there. Because if, uh, if you take this definition as it is now, then somebody might easily say, well, I was affected by this kind of content personally, right? Uh, and for, uh, for uh, the general audience, uh, or in, in, in the context in which a particular content was published, it, it might not be as harmful as the, the particular victim claims to be, or uh, say the platform perceives it to be. So the context is really important because uh, language is contextual, right? So, and there is no provision for any contextual analysis of. How do you resolve that? So in my opinion, the best way forward is to at the very least include context as an element of the definition of harm so that platforms and the regulator can assess the content in context, if, if, if you will. So, for example, even terrorist content, for example, uh, might, might not be as clear-cut as one might think. So, for example, in the context of the Israeli and Palestine uh, conflict earlier uh, this year, posts that featured um, the name of a mosque uh, that were not terrorist content were taken down erroneously because... There was no assessment of the content, the context of that mm. content. Mm. So that's important. Of course, these decisions are subjective. It's not easy to just, uh, you know, uh, lay down exactly what kinds of content are going to be harmful. Uh, but a mention of the relevance of context is important, so that it's it's clear that the regulator and uh, in scope services need to take that into account mm. whenever deciding uh, on, on, on harms. Uh, Professor Renwick, you've, you've heard what uh, Dr. Dallas has, has outlined there. Do you have anything to add or do you have any thoughts on what she said? Um, <clears throat> so I very much agree with uh, Professor Diaz regarding the strengths of the bill. Uh, regarding the weaknesses of the bill as it stands, draft bill, uh, I come at that very much as a student of democracy and someone who thinks about how to ensure that democracy can work effectively. <clears throat> and I think the omission of harm to democracy uh, from the bill is a serious concern. It was very clear in the original white paper uh, that harm to democracy was a, ma a matter that the government cared about and was concerned about and wanted to act upon. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, that has... Uh, disappeared from the bill in, in the, the course of its development. And I think when we're thinking about democracy, there are two key aspects that matter. One is freedom of expression, uh, which is an absolutely central tenet of democracy, and that is clearly very strong in the bill and strongly protected by the bill. Um, but the other is uh, the dangers caused by misinformation, uh, which again, were very strong in the, white, the original white paper. Uh, but have disappeared almost entirely from the bill. And uh, I, I think it, it is essential uh, for this bill to have regard to the danger to democracy caused by misinformation. Um, and I think were it to do so, uh, then there are, I, I suppose, three broad elements to an approach to seeking to overcome those dangers. One is measures that seek directly to address misinformation. So in most extreme uh, cases, by taking down material, but also by adjusting algorithms, by uh, ensuring that there is fact checking and flagging of, uh, of uh, material that has been found by reputable fact checkers to be problematic. So there's that set of measures. Then secondly, there are measures to promote uh, media literacy, 
which again are in the bill, but it's rather difficult to see quite what those measures are going to actually do and what their uh, extent might be. Um, and then thirdly, we need also to care about ensuring that good quality, accurate, accessible information is read readily available uh, for citizens in a democracy. And that just isn't present in the bill at all. Mm. And then if I might just add one, one further thought, uh, when we're dealing with these aspects, these matters of democracy, we clearly need to be very concerned about process and ensuring about the democratic process can't be unduly skewed by someone uh, powerful uh, who, who wants to uh, uh, skew the pitch in their favor. And in that regard, I I'm somewhat concerned by some of the powers for ministers that are proposed um, by the bill. Uh, we ought to have a system where um, the broad rules are set out by parliament and are subject to detailed parliamentary scrutiny, which means primary so, legislation. Just to cut across you there, uh, Professor, what, what, what specific part of the powers of ministers is it, for example, where they can uh, move companies from one tier to another? What, what is the area that, you, that you're really concerned about there? Uh, so, so that is one point. Another point is the ability of ministers to direct changes in codes of practice uh, in order that they should um, fit with government policy, for example, uh, which is in clause uh, 33, I think, of the bill. Um, so, so there are a number of aspects there. And, and I think, the, the, I think the, the principle should be that Parliament sets out a framework that is provided for in primary legislation, which can be properly scrutinized, uh, rather than simply in secondary legislation. Uh, and, and then the, the regulator uh, should operate within that framework and should be independent from uh, political direction that may be skewed mm. uh, from one side of the debate. Yeah. Yeah, what you, your concern is effectively that, that a minister could dictate to Ofcom uh, a change of direction when it comes to codes of practice, and that in turn could lead to essentially a sort of uh, potential sort of censorship or perhaps a, a favouring of one particular viewpoint over another. Exactly so. Right. Yeah, that is the danger, I think. Thank you. Uh, I just say to the witnesses. If everyone could just sort of either move close to the microphones, maybe, if possible, or at least sort of speak up, or put, adjust your volumes, if that's okay. We're just having one or two members having some difficulty just uh, hearing you. Um, so, Lord Putnam, thank, thank, I just, thank I just you for joining us. Uh, hi. Um, could you just um, also just add to this in terms of, you've heard what uh, Dr. Dias has said, um, the professor. Um, what are your thoughts for also from a, a parliamentary viewpoint and societal viewpoint of exactly where we go with this and where are the, the areas that we should really be sort of focusing on when we want to improve the bill? If I may, I'll pick up just on two points, one that Alan's made and one that Professor Day has made. Uh, Alan's point about the removal of the issues of harm to democracy is a very, very serious one. Now, interestingly, I felt that our report, we did look hard at this, uh, anticipated the events which actually occurred on the 6th of January. And what's weird about the, the government's response is it's as though the opposite happened, as though the, there was a certain amount of alarm that what could happen, that what could happen to undermine democracy through this information. <laughs> it's as though it didn't occur. So what it, it's a very, very peculiar response to actually an, 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 a very serious event. And it allows me to think that the governments are very extraordinarily complacent uh, about harms to democracy. Uh, Professor Diaz also touched on the issue of duty of care, which is something I'm pretty obsessed by. And what she, I'm sure, knows better than I do, is that duty of care applies not so much to what is done, but fa a failure to act or not acting. So duty of care is, is actually trying to anticipate what might happen. And I would suggest as a parliamentarian that every single member of parliament will have within their own constituency in the next five years a Molly Russell case. It will happen. So every single member of parliament is going to have to answer to their constituents here, so what they did, what protections they laid in, and how they attempted to influence the events that, that could have led to a Molly Russell situation. And I think not to do so is not to exercise a duty of care. So that's, that's where I, I deal with the come down the duty of care issue. Come to give another tiny bit of context, I was very impressed actually by the Prime Minister's speech uh, to the UN yesterday, 
where he basically said it's time for humanity to grow up. And he used the phrase to understand who we are and what we're doing. And he said the, the adolescence of humanity is coming to an end. I would argue that the adolescence of social media is coming to an end. And the flaw in the bill is it's treating social media as a mischievous adolescent, not as a very, very serious component of all of our futures. Mm. But that, that and I can, I can expand on that, obviously. But those would be my broad contextual thoughts. Thank you. Uh, Damien Green. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, can I continue with the, the, the democratic thought and, and, and maybe stick with, with Lord Putnam? Um, good morning, uh, everybody. Um, the, one of the things the bill does, as, as we've agreed, is give quite significant powers to not just the regulator but the, the Secretary of State. Do you think it provides for sufficient parliamentary oversight uh, of, of how those powers are exercised? Uh, simply stated, no, I, I don't think it does at all. Um, one of the things I would like to say is that no, the, the, the secret of our report lies in the, ti- in, in the title, which was I chose to call it the resurrection of trust because all the evidence we took suggested that trust had collapsed so that we're dealing with a much more serious situation in my view. Uh, and this was a unanimous report. It was an all-party report, cross-party report, I say. Um, and uh, can I say, Damien, if I may, I found the government's response to be lamentable absolutely lamentable, in that it didn't actually address the, the evidence or the arguments we made. It addressed our recommendations, which is fine, but it didn't address the evidence lying behind the recommendations. And I would be much more uh, upset, if you like, than I am, but for the fact that I have some experience of pre legislative scrutiny, and that the 45 recommendations we've made will be trawled through by the pre legislative scrutiny uh, committee that's sitting right now. And I think it will be very interesting to see how many of those get resurrected and how much of the evidence we offered does to get taken very seriously. And it's a great occasion of great sadness to me that government blew that opportunity, in, and I still don't quite understand why. It was a very, very poor, ill-thought-through uh, response to a, a report that had taken a year to compile and had taken evidence from all around the world. I'm, 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 in that context, I'm, I'm fascinated by your analogy that the, the tech companies are not sort of adolescents. They are now... I mean, I know from my own experience in you know, when I was a minister, you, you sat across the table from the big tech companies, and they weren't that interested in the British government because they were bigger than we were, effectively. Um, yep. And so they're not just, as it were, adults and, and not sort of you know, hippies playing in, you know, in, in, the, in the garage anymore. They are very, very powerful adults who know how powerful they are and are quite happy to use that power. Mm. And, and, and so do you think that... The underlying problem is that the government sort of doesn't get that, doesn't acknowledge that you are dealing with certainly hugely powerful and potentially quite dangerous people in terms of the tech giants. Well, maybe when I say uh, adolescents, I'm referring to a, a, a mob of adolescents uh, because that's that's certainly what would make me fearful if I was a football crowd and they turned on me. Um, I, I, there's a more nuance than that, if I may suggest. I don't think the people who founded these companies were bad people. And I don't think they were ill-intentioned people. I think that the power they, that accrued to them was almost accidental, in, in, in a sense. They then basically fell into the hands of shareholders. And what they know, and I'm going to say no, I really mean no. What they know is that the changes they can make to their algorithms, the changes they can make to their business practices, will reduce their revenues. And they can't confront their shareholders with the notion of a reduction of their revenues. So the, 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 the argument that lies out there, and I, su- I suspect Alan certainly agrees with this, they know exactly what they can do to tweak their algorithms and make them safer. They know what to, how to protect the Molly Russells, if you like. But it would cost them money, cost them revenues, cost them reach. And one of the most powerful points we made, if, if I may say, was we argued that it isn't a question of freedom of speech. It's a question of freedom of reach. And there's a moment which they have an obligation to challenge reach. Um, we suggested it's roughly 5,000. And they have the algorithmic ability to do this, incidentally. That once a piece of misinformation or disinformation has reached 5,000 voices, uh, that should be challenged by the, uh, by the organizations themselves and either taken down or they should be required to justify it. Now, all the evidence we took and all the work we did in that is largely ignored in the government's response to us. And I say, I'm still genuinely puzzled as to why. Thank you. Um, Professor Rennick, do you, do you broadly share that analysis that actually there are practical steps that could be taken in terms of this legislation and regulation 
that it, it is in danger of not being there, and that therefore this you know, effectively this, you know, this country is going to get one shot at this type of regulation, and that we're in danger of misfiring. Yes, I agree with everything that Lord Putnam has just said. And if I can just go back to your original question there about the powers of ministers, I think um, there have been concerns expressed, concerns expressed by the Constitution Unit, by the Hansard Society, and by others for some time about uh, delegated powers and the, uh, ability, the, the powers that ministers are accruing in, in many areas. And it would seem that this bill proposes to do that again. And I thought there was an interesting point made in the written evidence submitted by Full Fact, who pointed out that we get legislation on immigration on average, they said, every two and a half years, whereas this is the first piece of legislation in this area for 18 years. And the government's argument for having extensive ministerial powers seems to be that it's very difficult to find parliamentary time and therefore we need to put the flexibility in this legislation to, to, to uh, make it um, foolproof against uh, developments. Um, but as Lord Putnam has pointed out, these matters are incredibly important. <laughs> they, they are at the heart of our democracy today. And our democracy is fundamentally important to all of us. So perhaps we should be thinking that actually these matters deserve a bit more parliamentary time that they have, than they have been getting in recent years, and that Parliament therefore should have a greater role in setting these rules. Thank you. Um, Dr Diaz, you set out at, at the outset some of your, your fears, uh, or, or you identify gaps in, in, in what's there in, in the way that um, our other witnesses have as, as well. What do you think the implications would be if, if the bill, more or less in its current form, came into force? What, you know, what would happen? What would go wrong? Uh, it can go either way. So the bill as it stands is, as I said, quite vague. So it might be that uh, what I think is most likely to occur is that because of the fines, the fines are really, really high. And if the regulator decides to enforce uh, the codes of conduct thoroughly and applies these fines, these high prohibitive fines, what's going to happen is that companies are going to err on the side of censorship. They're just going to take down everything, especially uh, with regards to illegal content, because that's the only measure that the bill sort of like lays out for that kind of content. So they're just going to take down. And when we think about take down, content takedowns, it's not going to be a, probably most of, of that content is not going to be taken down by a human. It's an algorithm. And algorithms are, you know, they're bound to fail because they're just code. They don't understand human language. So what's going to happen is that the majority of content, whether it's disinformation, what, well, alleged disinformation, whether it's offensive, satirical, nudity, all of these kinds of content are going to be taken down. Most cases, it will be an algorithm. So that's, that's the problem. Uh, what, what's, the bill is setting the stage for uh, enhanced censorship, whether it's by companies themselves or by the regulator, because we don't know what's going to be in this code of practice, because the bill doesn't really lay out, apart from very general objectives, it doesn't really spell out the measures, the, the, the exact steps, not necessarily to the very detail, but it doesn't really say, okay, what are the options, what are the measures, how is freedom of expression going to be limited, in what ways, we don't know as users and companies also don't know. So they're going to be, uh, they're going to tend to, to, to censor because they want to protect themselves from the fines. So that's the, that's the implication. And I agree with uh, what Lord Putnam said before, that uh, the root of the problem is, is, are algorithms. So they're the root of the problem, and the bill doesn't really say much about them, about measures to tweak those algorithms or to at least review those algorithms, whether it's by a third party or the companies themselves. Because, um, so I like to think of this as, as an analogy between, um, you know, a fan and a broom. And that's what these companies are doing. So they have different teams which are uh, purposefully separated because uh, the idea is that they don't know what each other is doing. And so, for example, the integrity team of Facebook is charged with, you know, taking down these chasing bad content. So misinformation, uh, you know, uh, electro interference, uh, hate speech or whatever. Right. So that's what the integrity teams are doing. 
But at the same time, the algorithms are, you know, just promoting that, you know. So it's almost as if you've got a fan, and that fan is just, you know, uh, spreading all the dirt, and then they're trying just to, to grab the pieces. And so is the, the sort of underlying solution, because it is obviously hellishly difficult to legislate in, in, yeah. in this kind of field, to, to allow the regulator to, to get into the algorithm and look at the algorithm and recommend quickly how that algorithm should be changed, is, would that be the solution? No, uh, that would have a lot of backlash from companies because they say that these algorithms are proprietary. Well, so yes. they, they won't let. So the solution, in my view, is to have a third party, mm. so auditor, a, a third, an independent auditor that's going to look at the algorithm or if that's not feasible, if there is reluctance to do that on the part of companies, at the very least, there should be specific transparency reports about how they train the algorithms. You know, so what is the type of content that is being used to, to train the data? Because these algorithms, they're machine learning algorithms, right? So we don't really understand how they work. What we understand is the kind of data that is fed to these algorithms. So in these transparency reports, there has to be absolutely an explanation of what kinds of data are being fed to these algorithms. Okay, so are we, are we using uh, content that is representative of different cultural groups in this country or in other countries? Because then we run into the risk of bias if we don't have a representative data set. Right? So all of these things need to be laid down in, in a transparency report. And as the bill stands uh, right now, there is nothing about that in, in the transparency. It, it, of course, the bill cannot regulate to the very last detail, but it can give uh, sort of like, it can specify that th this kind of um, process, review process, needs to be part of the transparency report. For example. One last question. David, you were nodding very energetically at the, at the point about algorithms. Do you, you feel that very strongly? I, I do, for two, uh, for two reasons. Number one, when we took evidence, I mean, the, um, there was the, the, all the companies made an enormous amount of, the, of how they were working ever more closely with the research organisations. Uh, Alan can expand on this. Uh, and that that was their route uh, through to find out more about their own algorithms. That position, according to the New York Times last Sunday, has now been reversed. They don't want to work. They're actually closing down research mm. because the research that's emerging is not actually su is not supporting their position. So I and I absolutely agree with what Professor Dia said. In our report, we do set out uh, a, a structure for as an, an impartial ombudsman, for want of a better word, I hate the word actually, but, um, but who will look at these things from an objective and public focused point of view is you know, how do we how do we reach a satisfactory balance between freedom of speech and responsibility? Uh, at the moment, I'm afraid the bill is, it comes down too hard on, free, on freedom of speech, much as I, I treasure freedom of speech, and has backed away from um, putting enough responsibility uh, on the companies. Just to finish on that, I don't happen to think that financial fines are all the answer. I've sat on, as you have, I've sat on a dozen, more, maybe more than a dozen, boards in my life. And when you get a board's attention, is when the board understands it has personal responsibility. That's the moment that you, it grabs you. So long as you think you can just deal with the fines because you're a huge organisation, yeah, that's unfortunate, but that's something for the auditors. Uh, it would be chargeable to get tax and maybe even insurable. So it's personal responsibility that I would like to see added to this bill. Chair. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Dr Das, um, in a uh, meeting with officials earlier, I suggest the idea of compliance officers in firms, a little bit like sort of the financial services sector. And they stated that actually the bill did not rule it out that Ofcom could potentially have the power to do this. Is that a fair interpretation? Well, it really depends on what Ofcom decides to do. Of course, uh, the bill, because it's vague uh, as to the powers of Ofcom and it gives Ofcom wide powers, then it, of course, that all of these things are possible, but we just don't know if they're going to do that. Mm. So that's the problem. And if Parliament thinks that this is what should happen, then it should lay down that clearly, rather than rely on the goodwill of Ofcom to just set that in place. So that's my view. Yeah. And, and do you think that is a potential solution uh, to this about in terms of oversight of algorithms, actually having someone on the ground paid for by the companies themselves, not by the taxpayer, 
but at the same time we're independent of those companies that may not have all the specialists to look precisely at algorithmic code and understand it, but can at least can ask exactly what does this algorithm do and what is the purpose and how is this enabling a better ecosystem? I think that's one way. That's one way forward. Uh, having an independent body that is constantly reviewing how the algorithm works. As you said, you know, it's impossible to know what exactly and why the algorithm decides as it does, but there has to be somebody, an independent body, that is going to oversee you know, the, the data that is fed to the algorithm and the results, you know, how the algorithm is working, is it working effectively? And uh, so far what we have is that we rely on companies to do that voluntarily. We don't have a body that, an independent body that is charged with doing that. And I think that's one way. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Brennan. Thank you, Chair, and, and thanks to our witnesses for appearing this morning. Dr. Dyers, um, something you said a moment ago kind of slightly sort of depressed me, which is you see, seem to suggest that because the companies don't like the idea of someone looking inside the magic box, that therefore, you know, it can't happen. Uh, and, and isn't that just, you know, a, an example of, the, of, the, of a, a, the, the, the power that tech companies have, even over you as a, as a you know, ac academic in this field, in terms of their, you know, people just assuming they have the power to prevent national state governments from wanting to regulate their activities appropriately? Yeah, it's depressing and the law is kind of on their side, I would say, because they can always claim that it is an issue of intellectual property. Why can't, why do you need another body though, that you seem to suggest you need a third body, why can't we simply legislate to say that, that the regulator should have the right to, um, whilst respecting commercial confidentiality, Absolutely. should have the right to, to look into how algorithms and the machine learning associated with them are affecting people's lives and the content that's being pushed out into the public sphere. Absolutely. If there is a safeguard of confidentiality, then that's feasible and that sort of like addresses the, the, the intellectual property concerns. And uh, many NGOs have proposed that kind of review. Mm -hmm. And they have proposed a way to sort of like balance, uh, you know, the need to review and assess algorithms with um, the need to preserve confidentiality and intellectual property. There is a way to do that. It has to be done well, and it has to be done with the right safeguards, but it is possible. But we don't have to be slaves to the algorithm. No, right. we don't. I'm glad we've established that. The, the, um, you mentioned earlier on that um, you thought that the, 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 the draft bill as proposed was vague in detail in relation to um, illegal content. In, in what way can you be vague about illegal content? Either it's illegal or it's legal. So the, the, the problem here is that, um, so first of all, illegal content um, includes things that might be criminal offenses or other types of wrongs like civil wrongs, right? So there is no differentiation there. And this is important because depending on the severity of the content, then different measures might be applicable. And that's a requirement of necessity and proportionality which is uh, necessary, so these requirements are necessary to, to give effective freedom of expression, to preserve freedom of expression. Um, and so that's my main issue with um, the definition of illegal content. And the second issue is that even though illegal content might, be, might correspond to content that is already uh, illegal under the law, so existing law already says, okay, this conduct is criminalized, this conduct is a civil wrong. Right. The problem here is that um, you, the, the bill is imposing additional limitations to some of these uh, kinds of acts. Right? So these kinds of acts are already illegal, but then there are the penalties uh, that the law provides for these kinds of conduct. Right? But here we are imposing new limitations, uh, limitations to freedom of expression because you're talking about speech acts. And we don't know exactly which among these criminal or not criminal illegal uh, acts are going to fall within the scope of the bill. So there is a range of illegal conduct that is out there, right? But we don't know exactly which one applies in the context of the bill. So that's the problem. And so, for example, we have those schedules for terrorists, 
mm. content and for yeah pornography. So that's my concern. But it, but it, you know it may not be possible to be as specific as that. But it may be possible to test all of that during the process of scrutiny of the of the bill as we as we go through with yeah. with those who are putting it together. Okay, thank you. Um, Thanks, Dr. Diaz. Um, David Putnam, um, you, were, you were saying earlier on about um, you know, social media companies being uh, adolescents, or if you like, not, not naughty boys anymore. They're, they're sort of, um, they should be expected to act in a, in a grown-up fashion. Google's original slogan used to be, don't be evil. Uh, and and, and isn't, isn't it the case that actually what we've known for over 2,000 years via the parable of the Good Samaritan is it's not enough to not be evil, you have to cross the street to be good and to do good. Is it unrealistically, hopelessly idealistic to expect us to be able to put together a piece of legislation here that would actually mean that social media companies were not only encouraged but compelled to do the right thing? It's a really important question, Kevin. At the, um, first of all, I've met the two original founders of, of, of Google, who are extremely nice guys, and I don't think it's insignificant that they have distanced themselves very greatly from the business. Um, I don't think they want the sort of heat that, uh, that Mark Zuckerberg gets. Uh, so I don't think to say there's inherent evilness there, and I certainly think that their original slogan was, was well-intentioned. But they no longer run the business, and the business is perpetuated by, by the market, by the marketplace. To touch on something you said about algorithms just now, we managed, I'm older, I'm a very old man now, we managed to struggle through the whole issue during my lifetime of nuclear verification. I think, I would argue that algorithmic verification is child, should be child's play compared with nuclear verification. So we can do it. As legislators, we can do it. It's having the, uh, the, the will to do it. And the other point I'd like to make in all of this, and it's, I think it's very important, and Professor Diaz will have her view as, as well, Alan, is I think the bill, as it stands, is an invitation to judi judicial review. Um, it, it basically would put Hofcom in an almost impossible position, and I particularly would highlight the issue here of personal versus group harms. Of the personal, the personal, the, the personal harm will inevitably, if it's a severe, severe harm, go to some form of class action suit. So they'll be supported by a group who will share their concerns. On the other side of the equation, you've got these very, very powerful companies. Um, to ask, uh, uh, Ofcom will then make a judgment. Either party will then have the ability to appeal. And I'm not a fan, I don't think you are, of judge-made laws. So I think it's really important, and I think it's really subject to what Professor Diaz is saying, it's very important that we straighten these things out now, or they will be straightened out over a period of 10, 20 years by the courts. And that could bring conflict between Parliament and, uh, and the courts. We've flirted with that in the past. I would not want okay. Britain to go there. So I, I think it's imperative that we sort out. I mean, personally, I don't think it's a, a better pound to a penny that we will end up going for the group harms, not just the personal harms, certainly when it comes to the House of Lords, and I'd like to think in the Commons. But um, I think so. I've, I've said this to officials. I think it's a major flaw in the bill. I think the sooner they straighten it out, the better because they will be avoiding the absolute inevitability of judicial review. Yeah, and, and I mean, that point leads me on to the question I was going to ask you, which is, which, why do you think the government has chosen to emphasise harm to the individual rather than, rather than the sort of generic harm to um, our democracy and so on that, that you recommended in your committee's report? I think, honestly, there's a history to this, and I actually sent to the, the, the department a clip. If you've got one minute, 40 seconds to spare at any point, go on to a, a, a YouTube, you'll see the evidence given by the so-called tobacco barons, they were actually called, it's called the Seven Dwarfs, in 1994, claiming that nicotine was not harmful and there was no relationship between nicotine and, uh, and, and, and poisoning. Three years later, that was settled in court, and a three, I think the figure is 385 billion dollar uh, fine was levied, but there was no acknowledgement of, 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 of responsibility. To me, we're going down exactly that road. We know that um, instantly when that uh, congressional hearing occurred, they were all swearing on oath. Uh, every one of those men for 15 years that had on their desk all the evidence they needed to know that nicotine was deeply harmful. Mm. So unless we kind of look back a bit, look at I, I've spent a lot of time looking at the road traffic acts and the way that those developed over years. We just got to get smarter, I'd suggest, Kevin, and look at the history of these things and understand that it is possible to head, head them off before you're dealing with seriously dramatic harms to okay. many, many 
millions, maybe thousands, uh, maybe millions of people. So, okay. um, yeah, I just look at history. We've made these mistakes before. We've been trapped into them, if you like. Uh, the corporate, the, the, the corporate uh, resolution has been a long time in coming forward. And even then, it's only based on fines. Fines aren't enough for all the reasons I was saying to Damien a few minutes ago. Okay. Sorry, but um, going off on that. Last question for, for Professor Rennick. Um, you, you know, you, you spoke earlier with the chair about the, the issue of, of, of content of democratic importance. Um, I guess, you know, if, you, if you're going to draft us a few amendments or the Joint Committee a few amendments to this bill to, to rectify that, what, in a nutshell, would they say? Well, it would emphasise that misinformation and disinformation constitute harms to democracy and need, therefore, to be taken into account alongside all the various other considerations uh, when uh, codes of practice are being uh, drafted and, and, uh, and subsequently implemented. Uh, so at present, we have... Uh, and the, the, the bill appears to protect... Uh, through its protection of um, democratically important material. Uh, it appears to protect uh, deliberate misinformation in the realm of democracy against any kind of intervention by these companies. So it seems to make things worse rather than better in respect of misinformation and disinformation. And uh, at very least, uh, 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 an element within the bill that countered that and ensured that these both of these considerations, freedom of expression and the dangers associated with misinformation, are, are taken into account and balanced appropriately. That would help. Okay. So you can perhaps get some of the super clever law students at UCL to uh, draft up a few uh, suitable amendments that would bring effect to what you've just said, with a bit of luck. Um, I'll Pass back to you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I think you're just getting the committee's job done for it now, aren't you? <laughs> uh, Giles Bottling. Th th thank you, Chair. Yes, um, uh, in the previous incarnation of this committee, we held a grand panel in Washington, and it was interesting that uh, we had a representative from Twitter and uh, Instagram, etc., there, and, uh, and it seemed at the time that uh, we had these undergrads who had created something wonderful in a garden shed and were suddenly brought blinking into the sunlight, uh, understanding the power and the importance of the uh, platforms they'd created. So I understand, uh, Lord Putnam, exactly what you're talking about, about this sort of adolescent thing, but it is incredibly powerful. Um, but but, but the, what I want to focus on uh, initially is... Um, uh, a comment that was in Politico a couple of weeks ago um, where they said that the UK wants to protect journalists uh, from plans to regulate big tech. It just doesn't seem to know how. And Oliver Dowden said um, that he wanted to place a protective bubble around journalistic and democratically important content in the upcoming online safety bill. Now, as uh, Dr. Diaz has said, um, th there's a lot of vagueness about this, but... Uh, do you think, and I think I addressed this to, to uh, initially to Alan Rennick, do you think that the uh, carve-out for journalistic content is sufficiently clear? Uh, well, uh, what, one point is that if freedom of expression matters, then it matters for everyone. So I'm not quite clear why uh, we should have specific carve-out for journalistic content and uh, content of democratic importance. And freedom of expression matters generally... <laughs> Uh, but it does need to be balanced uh, against the need also to protect society against deliberate misinformation and disinformation. <laughs> and again, that, apl that applies across the piece. So I I'm not sure terribly uh, why, why the there should be specific provisions uh, for journalistic content. So you'd rather, you'd rather it be a general expression rather than and focusing particularly on freedom of the press, which is the much lauded phrase, of course. Of course, uh, but uh, free expression is something is a right for all of us in a democracy. And you know, as we uh, move into the, uh, as we have moved into the digital age, then the distinction between journalists and the rest of us has rather diminished. And uh, all of us have very important rights of free expression. And all of us, if we are saying things in public, have duties uh, to have regard to the effects of what we say upon. Uh, society as a whole. So, um, and, and I turn to uh, Dr. Diaz here um, on this one because uh, th there is a, a particular 
carve out for journalistic con- content within the bill. Do you think that should still be there? No, I completely agree uh, with what Professor um, Rebek said before. I think that uh, freedom of expression uh, is a right of everyone. And also, let's not forget equality and non-discrimination, which apply side to side with uh, freedom of expression. And as the bill stands at the moment, sections 13 and 14 and these carve-outs, they seem a little bit out of place. Mm -hmm. And you can see this in particular by looking at uh, subsection uh, 7 of of section 13 and subsection 10 of section 14 for journalistic content. So you can see that there are some uh, sort of like more temperate actions, right, to deal with these kinds of of content. So rather than just taking down the content, these kinds of, 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 these people are entitled to not just being, uh, you know, uh, not having their content just taken, taken down, but having a warning, being suspended, you know, restricting the user's ability. So you can see that these, uh, these measures are actually good, but they only apply to journalistic and uh, um, content of democratic importance. However, um, the, the, the platforms uh, want to des- define what is democratic content, right? So these uh, privileges, if you will, should apply to everyone. Right, rather than just having their, their, their content taken down. As, as Alan Rennick said, yes. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to turn to um, uh, uh, last week, the, the, the Wall Street Journal, I don't know if you've seen it, uh, published a five part series called The Facebook Files. Uh, and uh, the, the, they had an investigation, and I just quickly run through it. Uh, Facebook had a system in place called whitelisting. Which, uh, which meant that uh, high-profile users would have a different review process than mm. regular users. Uh, it commissioned studies that repeatedly found that Instagram can have har- harmful mental health impact on users. Uh, it, 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 and it, it came up with other, other points. I just wondered if um, the practices of Facebook uh, at Instagram uh, and at Facebook, uh, described by the Wall Street Journal, have in any way changed your perspective on how we should approach regulating uh, big tech, and I'd like to go to Lord Putnam with that. Um, I, I read the piece, uh, and I certainly agree with it. I don't think it, it should alter our attitudes to it, but I think it does. It should be a, a warning shot across the, the, the legislation. Um, Instagram was directly, as you know, related to the Molly Russell case. So the very first thing I'm mm, saying yes. about uh, <coughs> each agency have it, kind of have its own crisis, I think uh, yeah, it, it's, it makes sense there. Can I go back one second to your, your earlier note? I think that, I don't blame him, the then Secretary of State, I'm sure, was just playing to the crowd with his remark about journalism and, and the freedoms of journalists. What we've suggested in our report is to take far more seriously the, the recommendations in the Cairn Cross review, which is a very, very good and very detailed review, and actually answered many of the questions that, uh, that were implied in, in, in your, your questions to, to um, uh, Alan and, uh, and uh, to, to Lisa. Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, that, that report was a good one. I would definitely recommend the re- report in this week's New York Times uh, regarding the, the backing away for Facebook from um, academic, academic inquiry and academic review. I think that, in a sense, maybe is even more significant, that they've reached a point where they don't really want to understand or to look at what they might be able to do to reduce these harms. So fundamentally, you're saying the will isn't there. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, Alan Rennick, do you have any comment on that? Uh, <clears throat> nothing to add, really. I mean, I don't think the stories were surprising. Uh, I don't think they <clears throat> told us anything we yeah. didn't already know. I mean, they just confirm that a large multinational corporation will need to be regulated. Uh, we, you know, we, we cannot expect a, a, a company on its own to do all the good stuff uh, from society's point of view. So we need to regulate so, so uh, the fact that anti-vaccine vaccine activists have used Facebook to so doubt and spread fear amongst the COVID uh, f- for the COVID nineteen deployment. Um, this, I mean, this is very serious, damaging stuff, and and this is part of the reason we are looking at regulation because this is people's lives here. So we we we, we have to regulate, but we ha- also have to take into account freedom of uh, expression. Uh, of speech, um, and you think that uh, we are moving too far towards the regulation and not paying enough attention to freedom of speech. Would that be fair? No, oh. uh, I think the so I think that the bill uh, places too much emphasis, at least in the democratic sphere, upon freedom of expression. I mean, 
So freedom of expression is, is fundamentally important. I'm not suggesting that, that we should downplay it, but it needs to be balanced against the need to protect society from harmful discourse, harmful um, uh, information and misinformation. And at present, that latter part is simply absent uh, from the bill. It was not absent from the white paper. It was very clear in the white paper, the original white paper, that ministers understood and were very concerned about the damage to trust and confidence in the democratic system uh, that is being caused at present. And I completely agree with what Lord Putnam said, that the events of the 6th of January on Capitol Hill illustrated where we can go uh, if we fail to t take seriously the threats caused by misinformation. And it does look like complacency on the part of the government not to take those threats seriously and incorporate them in this bill. Thank you. Point well made. Thank you. Thank you. Alex Davis-Jones. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for joining us today. We do really appreciate it. Um, Dr. Diaz, if I come to you first, please. Um, we know that Germany was the first sort of country in the world to try and take a stand on this, and they introduced their landmark legislation in 2017, their unique hate speech law, to try and get online accountability for this. But it's recently been highly criticised for not working, um, particularly by women, public officials who feel like nothing has changed, and in fact it's, it's made the situation worse by pushing it into uh, unregulated websites and, and social media accounts. What can we learn from Germany um, to stop that happening with this legislation, and how does our legislation differ from that and other jurisdictions in the world? So uh, the German approach is one that comes closer to the idea of intermediary liability that I've mentioned earlier, as opposed to uh, a duty of care. So there is, a, in particular, there is a duty to take down, swiftly take down uh, illegal content, including hate speech, terrorist content, in a matter of hours. Uh, and the problem there, again, and subject to penalties, uh, um, again, like, like our legislation. Um, and the problem is, of course, as I said earlier, that will drive companies to, to, to self-censor themselves, to over-censor, right? And what happens is, as I said, that, that, that content moderation happens through algorithms because there is no way a human being can do that in a, scale, a scalable manner. Right, so they have to rely on algorithms, and what's going to happen is that these algorithms are going to delete uh, content that, um, you know, uh, sometimes uh, is actually content that is uh, denouncing uh, what's wrong uh, on social media uh, because they don't have contextual knowledge, the technology, right? Uh, and so what's going to happen is that this is going to jeopardize vulnerable populations rather than you know protect them so that's the main problem with the German uh, legislation and also one main point of criticism from many NGOs is that they didn't have um, access to justice provisions um, and uh, they amended the bill uh, if I'm not mistaken last year to include something to cover that but it was still far from ideal because the inclusion was uh, basically um, out of court proceedings. So basically there is an arbitral tribunal that is meant to settle these disputes. But that doesn't solve the problem because there's still no access to, to, to justice, to public justice, right? Uh, so these are some of the main problems with the, with the German approach. Um, the French uh, bill initially was following the, the German, but then uh, the Constitutional Council sort of like um, scraped out the bill because uh, of those concerns of, of censorship, freedom of expression, and so on and so forth. So what lessons can we learn from the German model? Um, we should not uh, um, require companies to uh, reboot, to just take down content immediately in one hour or in two hours. There has to be a little bit more time and there has to be alternative measures to just content takedowns. And the emphasis should be, as I said earlier, on the duty of care rather than the, the specific ty types of content that are published online and that are left online. So if the, there has to be a, a, an emphasis on whether the companies are doing their best rather than if they are removing particular pieces of content. 
So a more sort of a holistic approach to what the company is doing overall with the transparency reports that they are required to do, uh, with you know, their algorithms, how are they you know, uh, enhancing their algorithms, how are they tweaking their algorithms. So that should be the focus of the bill, not intermediary liability. Intermediary liability is not, uh, is not an option. But the bill as it stands at the moment, although uh, it's purported to be a model of uh, duty of care, um, some, uh, some aspects of the bill do come close to intermediary liability, and that's what worries me the most, mm -hmm. and that's the penalty aspect, the penalties uh, that are enforced by the, the regulator, uh, and we don't know how, as I said earlier. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, well, Putnam, if I come to you, please. Um, you attended the International Grand Committee in Dublin that occurred during the 2019 general election. How do you think the UK government's approach differs from that of our international partners to this issue? Um, I would say that we are somewhat behind the consensus that existed on that on that uh, commit on that committee. Uh, I've now, thanks to Damien Green, I'm, I'm sorry, to Damien Collins, I've been able to feed in and stay familiar with what's going on. So I do think we are we're back, we tend to be back markers. Let's just touch on the German issue. Yeah, of uh, 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 it's a long time ago, 1973. I did two films on Germany from 1918 to 1945, looking at the rise of fascism. It doesn't surprise me at all that there is an, a reflex reaction response, as it were, within Germany to anything that could disturb the kind of, I think, rather brilliantly built democracy that we, we actually helped put together. When we took evidence from around the world during our committee, uh, the most interesting, honestly, was from Estonia. Estonia sees misinformation and disinformation as an existential threat for them. They sit hard on the border of, of, uh, of Russia, 20% of their population is of Russian origin, and their evidence and the way they deal with this, I think sensitively and sensibly, was exemplary. Uh, and I would recommend to the committee that it's worth, well worth reading that evidence. Uh, they, were, they were actually brilliant and, and thoroughly impressed our committee. So um, yes, I, I think there are lessons to be learned from everywhere. Singapore is quite interesting, in our terms, probably slightly draconian. Canada, I think, has got a very good grip on these on these issues. There, it's a very stimulating group to be among. And of course, what's important is that David, and I'm, I'm sure I pronounced his wrong name wrongly, David Ciccioni, who was the American representative, of course, is now the ranking congressional figure on the investigations into uh, regulation in the United States. So it's it, it, it's not a limp committee. It's actually a committee with quite a lot of uh, oomph to it, uh, which is quite promising. Yeah. Good, it's good to hear. I intend to, uh, if I can, I intend to attend further meetings. Fantastic, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Kevin Brennan. Um, thanks, thank you, Chair. Um, just my colleague Giles Watlin um, raised the, the the Wall Street Journal article earlier on. I think uh, it's only fair that we should give Facebook a sort of right of reply here, because I don't know if. It, if anyone's read the recent blog post by the Vice President for Global Affairs and Communications of Facebook, someone called Nick Clegg, and uh, what, what he says in his blog post, what the Wall Street Journal got wrong, and perhaps I can put this to David Putnam, what he said was, these stories have contained deliberate mischaracterizations of what we are trying to do and confirmed egregiously false motives to Facebook's leadership and employees. And he went on to say, we fundamentally reject this mischaracterization of our work and impugning of the company's motives. What would your reaction be um, to that uh, robust response um, by the Vice President of Facebook? Uh, I think the Vice President very, very eager to keep his job. I'm sure it's uh, well remunerated. <laughs> uh, I'd, 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 I'd reject his rejection. Um, interestingly, they themselves were appointed effectively an ombudsman, this, uh, this, this group, this, this very, very senior group. And one of the charges laid is that the, the senior group, and Alan Rusbridge is on it, um, the former Prime Minister of, De of Denmark is on it, one of the charges made is that they have deliberately uh, not supplied that group with information mm -hmm. that would be quite crucial when they're making decisions. Now, my argument, again, about that group, that they themselves are very highly paid. If you create a group of people to whom sitting on that uh, ombudsman type committee is a very significant proportion of their total income, you're not necessarily going to get a wholly objective uh, res response. So I think there's something essentially flawed in all of Facebook's uh, responses to criticism. They don't like it. 
They believe they can ride it out, and only legislators such as yourself can do anything to stop them. That's, this is where the buck stops. The, I don't think there is a cosy um, compromise to be reached. Basically, they are either regulated companies, just because you regulate energy companies and anything else, or they are unregulated because they're too, they're too big to deal with. Professor Rennick, just, just to follow up on that, that, he goes on in his blog post to say, at the heart of this series, of, uh, uh, of this series is an allegation that is just plain false. The Facebook conducts research and then systematically and willfully ignores it if the findings are inconvenient for the company. Uh, and, and in the next paragraph he says, though, the fact that not every idea that a researcher raises is acted upon doesn't mean Facebook teams are not continually considering a range of of different improvements, rather undermining, I thought, the previous statement that he's made. But, but w w what's your reaction to that, Professor Rennie? Uh, 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 oh, yes, yeah, sorry, David. Uh, first, yeah. And then, if I may, just hand over to Alan, because he'll uh, give you a, probably a better, but maybe more balanced view. The answer is very clear. Follow the evidence. Ask the academic community whether they are getting increasing or decreasing access to the, the algorith algorithmic systems that fa Facebook use. If the, if, the, if the consensus from the academic community is that Facebook have been very helpful and very open, then, then everything I'm saying is nonsense. If, on the other hand, as I suspect, consensus from the academic community is they're being blocked from getting the, the access they'd like, then I'm afraid what I'm saying is, uh, is, is absolutely correct and verified. Thank you. Briefly, Professor Rennick. Yes, I, I can't address that specific point because I haven't sought such access. Um, but what I would say is that I, I'm entirely open to the idea that um, pe the people running Facebook are very good people and are very well-intentioned people and are trying to do a good job. Um, but the fact is that they have interests at stake and they are subject to the laws of human nature. And we all are. And we, we, we all have to think about how we may be biased. And they are among the people who may be biased. Uh, so, for any company such as this, it is necessary to have a proper regulatory system in order to ensure that those biases, even if they're wonderfully well-intentioned people, do not need to... I just give a last word to Dr. Diaz. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I just agree with what has been said uh, before. And also one thing to bear in mind is that these companies, we can't think of them as amorphous entities, right? Uh, they're different people, different teams, and sometimes these teams are isolated from each other purposefully, right? And I have spoken to people working at Facebook who are really well-intentioned, really professional, really keen to make a difference, and also at Twitter. I'm friends with, for example, uh, Twitter's Human Rights Council, and these people are well-intentioned. Um, but the problem is the, the high-ranking leadership. There's a problem, and there is a, a huge separation between what happens uh, there at the top and what happens at the bottom. Mm. Right, so that's something that, that is important to bear in mind, that sometimes uh, the big decisions, they don't come from Facebook as a whole, but they come from the top leadership. So that, that's the main problem. Um, and also one point uh, that was raised earlier about regulation and freedom of expression. I think it's important to um, also remember that um, regulation is not the antithesis or the, uh, the opposite to, to freedom of expression. It's actually a necessary safeguard because people need to have clear notice of how their freedom of expression is going to be limited. So the more specific, the clearer the regulation, then the better it will be for freedom of expression. So that's just what I wanted to raise. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, concludes our session today. Uh, Lord Putnam, Professor Remick and Dr. Das, thank you very much for joining us today. Order, order. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.
The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The 
The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.
The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The